Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Anthony Philpot, your moderator for this session, concurrent session 4A, which is a combined session. And we will now begin with our first presentation, Reaching Students Through Teaching with Karen Bernstein and Kotlin Harrington. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Anthony. Let me pull up our slides here. Alrighty. Um, so uh, to begin, I'm Kotlin Harrington, and I am presenting today with my colleague, Karen Brunsting, and we are from the University of Memphis. And we're going to talk briefly today about our experience as technical services librarians teaching a one credit hour course at our institution. So a little bit of background to begin. Um, we are at the University of Memphis. It's a public R2 institution located in the mid-sized city of Memphis in the Mid-South. Um, our fall FTE was about 16 and a half thousand students. Um, we are in the university libraries of University of Memphis, and that includes the Ned R. McWhorter Library as our main branch, plus uh, three branch libraries. I'm the electronic resources librarian. I've been in my role since July of 2016, and Karen is the acquisitions and collection development librarian, and she joined us in January of 2020. Um, in fall of 2019, we received uh, a strategic priority from our executive director to promote instruction as the number one priority for the university libraries. Um, and if you can't tell from our job titles, instruction is not really a part of uh, mine and Karen's work. Uh, so, we took an opportunity that was presented by the Helen Hardin Honors College at the University of Memphis. They offer a class every fall that's called Honors Forum. And it's a one credit hour course. And they describe it as an opportunity for faculty to identify uh, important areas of knowledge that have not yet found their way into the regular undergraduate curriculum. And proposals are accepted from all University of Memphis faculty, regardless of their department. So as librarians, we don't traditionally, um, at University of Memphis, we don't traditionally teach credit bearing classes. And then as technical services librarians, we have limited experience with even one shot teaching. Um, so this was a new opportunity for us. And some of the examples that we were given of previous classes that were taught as part of this honors forum program were Bob Dylan's art of self invention, being a fan of Disney, uh, physics of movies, what's right and what's wrong. And so we took this as an opportunity to um, think of something fun that, that would interest us and hopefully the students that we taught. So the class that we developed was called Edit Wikipedia for the Undergraduate Researcher. And um, this class was first taught in fall 2019 with a different, I co-taught it with a different person it was before Karen joined us at University of Memphis. And my former co-teacher moved on to a new position. And so um, I invited Karen to start co-teaching with me for fall of 2020. So I've caught, taught it for two years and Karen's taught it for one year. And this class was developed to use Wikipedia as a lens through which to teach undergraduate students about research methods. And um, we assumed that our students were familiar with Wikipedia as consumers but we wanted uh, them to get a look behind the scenes as editors. So some of the goals that we had for our class was of course research methods. We did um, some pretty typical information literacy instruction on database use um, and finding good resources, uh, citation creation, scholarly communication, those types of things. It was important for us as technical services librarians to emphasize information privilege um, our unique role as technical services means that we're pretty behind the scenes. We know about the licensing, we know about the subscriptions, we know about how much money it costs to make these resources available. And we wanted to stress to our students the privilege that they have as, you, as institutional users to the abundance of information that we at the library provide access to. And um, one way of, of addressing some of that privilege is by editing Wikipedia and sharing information that we have access to through contributions to Wikipedia. And so that was an important um, 
area for us to focus on with this class. And then we also were hoping to, incur to engage as much as possible with local history. We encouraged our students to um, edit articles that related to Memphis, um, notable people in Memphis, notable places, events, and really enrich the public history of Memphis. Hi, everyone. Um, as Kotlin mentioned, I'm Karen Brunsting. Um, so we, uh, we developed a course structure where the first half of the course, approximately seven weeks, is lecture-based. Um, we still did an activity each, time, each class period, um, helping them get ready to edit Wikipedia, such as registering for, um, as editors and setting up a Wikipedia sandbox to work in. Um, but primarily, um, we lectured, and um, in addition to discussing concepts such as information privilege, we use the lectures to introduce the students to Wikipedia. We explain what it is, um, you know, it's a digital encyclopedia, uh, and what it is not. Um, Wikipedia is not a dictionary, it's not a how-to manual. It's especially not a soapbox where we present our opinions. Um, and this becomes important later on as they are editing articles. Uh, we also talk about how Wikipedia started um, and some of the reasons their professors might not want them to use Wikipedia as a uh, source in their research papers. Um, we also talk about Wikipedia's three main tenets, um, which are notability, verifiability, and neutrality. And these um, concepts are specific, or the definitions uh, I'm gonna tell you about are specific to Wikipedia. Um, so they use notability um, uh, as a concept that only topics or subjects that have gained sufficiently significant attention by the world at large and over a period of time warrant a Wikipedia article. Um, notability addresses whether or not we're likely to find enough sources to craft a complete article and, um, and multiple reliable sources are required to meet this notability criteria. Uh, verifiability relates to reliable sources a, as well. Readers must be able to check that any of the information they find on Wikipedia um, is accurate and is not just made up. Um, so this means, of course, that all material must be attributable to reliable published sources and no original research is allowed. Um, neutrality or a neutral point of view is the concept, um, not that the topic itself has to be neutral. Um, you can write about controversial topics, but the, uh, the article itself must remain neutral. So it, uh, you cannot take sides in the article. If there are multiple viewpoints, all of the viewpoints should be represented in the article. Um, the first year this class was taught, some of the students found these concepts a little bit difficult to grasp. So the second year we spent a class period uh, on each concept and gave a lot of examples, um, did in-class activities. And then we also used the midterm as an opportunity to verify that the students understood these concepts. Uh, I'll talk about the midterm a little more in a moment. Um, we also use the first half of the semester to show students how to find an article to edit. They were given the opportunity to either create a new article in Wikipedia or to find an article that needed some work and to edit that article. And Wikipedia uh, provides a number of ways to find articles that need work. Um, they have different classes of articles, uh, both stub class, uh, stub class and, and start class are articles that are very short and need to be fleshed out. And they also, um, they flag articles that need, um, that need work on citations or resources or all sorts of issues. And we encourage the students to find a topic or an article early because they can use this throughout the semester and a lot of the um, coursework pertains specifically to these articles so they can essentially um, uh, work on their final as we go along. Um, the second half of the course was more activity-based with fewer lectures 
And we basically taught the students everything they would need to create or edit their Wikipedia article. Um, for example, you know, we did some research methods and, and showed them how to find sources. We showed them specifically how to create citations in Wikipedia, how to edit or add information to articles. Each class was one step in the process and um, each class had an activity involved where they were required, uh, for example, to find three sources on their topic or to create um, you know, a citation um, for their topic. So by the end of the semester, we hoped that they would have their final article finished. The major assignments that we had for this course, uh, the midterm is a writing assignment. So again, using the topic or the article they've chosen to edit, they are required to write 250 words on the topic's notability, 250 words on its neutrality and on its verifiability. Again, this gives us the opportunity to see if they've mastered those concepts and then also to provide feedback on their topic. Um, the next major assignment is the final. And the final is simply to create their Wikipedia article or to edit an existing article. And to grade this, we facilitated the creation of a rubric in class. So the students themselves determine how many sentences they needed to create or add to an article, how many sources they needed to use, how many citations they needed to create, um, and also what the quality of writing needed to be for them to receive an A in the class. And then again, you know, how many sentences for a B and for a C, et cetera. Um, uh, this year, I think they were a little tougher on themselves or 2020, I should say, they were a little tougher on themselves and, um, you know, Kotlin and I encouraged them to be a little bit uh, easier, but I think we ended up with eight sentences were required, um, four citations, et cetera, that, that was for an A. The last major assignment was a presentation. Um, again, we were trying to make this so they don't have to do a lot of work outside of class. So we didn't require slides for their presentation. We gave them a time frame of three to five minutes. And um, we also gave them the option of either choosing, uh, I'm sorry, either speaking about how they chose their topic or uh, what they learned while they were editing the topic. And then- I'm Sorry to interrupt, Karen. We have about yeah. three more minutes left. All right, thank you. All right. Um, Colin, do you want to go to what we learned? Um, I think we can we can quickly get through the next two slides in just two minutes and then we'll have time for questions afterwards, I think, so we can address anything else that we didn't get to through questions if there's interest. So this semester, fall 2020, we, we shifted to Zoom as many institutions did. We had issues with engagement and attendance. It was much harder to do group activities, although we did employ breakout rooms as much as possible. Um, it should also be mentioned that all of these uh, students were first year students. And so they were not only having their first um, semester in college, but they were doing it during a pandemic. And Karen and I were also experiencing a pandemic like everyone here on the Zoom call was. So um, we were all under unique stresses created by a global event. Um, and so there were issues with communication and engagement and getting students to be fully active over Zoom when this class was designed to be done in person. And so just very quickly on plans for the next time we teach this class in fall 2021, which we will, we hope it'll be in person. Mm -hmm. And um, we plan to create more in-between assignments, particularly assignments that uh, spend more time thinking about how to choose a topic, uh, thinking about looking at, um, if a topic already has a bunch of citations, which means it doesn't need us to come in and help it, or doing a little research on the front end to make sure uh, good resources exist for a topic. We hope to do some field trips in the future to the library and to special collections. We have been toying with um, requiring students to pick a local Memphis topic to edit on, which would require uh, greater engagement with special collections, which is not a department that Karen and I work in. And so we'd have to create a collaborative relationship 
with that department. And with that, I'm gonna say thanks and we'll look forward to your questions at the end. All right, thank you both. And as a reminder, you can submit your questions in the chat and we will get to those at the end of the session. And now we will move to our second presentation, History Rhymes, the role of learned societies in the open research landscape with Vincent Cassidy. Can you all see my slides? Yep, you're good. Okay, um, just a second, I'm having a... Can you see my slides? Or you... uh, right now we're seeing your whole like PowerPoint window. Okay. Now we just see the slide. So uh, um, thanks very much uh, for the invitation to speak to you today. So thanks, Anthony. My name is Vincent Cassidy. I'm the Director of Research and Academic Markets at the IT. Uh, the IT is the Institution of Engineering and Technology. And uh, we're celebrating in 2021 our 150th anniversary as one of the world's leading professional and learned membership organizations with over 160,000 members globally. I'm speaking to you here from London on a Friday evening, but we also have offices in New Jersey, Beijing, Bangalore, and Hong Kong. We support people of all ages from school children through students, researchers, engineering professionals, educating them and supporting them in their careers. So, um, I'm sure many of you have uh, recognized the title of my talk contains a little reference to Mark Twain, who said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And the premise of my talk is that changes in the process of scholarly and research communications are creating new opportunities for learned societies. So as research becomes more multi and inter interdisciplinary and the open research and movement impacts research workflows, the role of learned societies to support, to connect, and to convene um, specialist communities is more needed and more valuable than ever. Um, the, the need to make sense of today's technological challenges is similar, I would argue, to the conditions that led to the foundation of organizations like the IET 150 years ago. Um, and I'd say that the recent history of scholarly communication has been focused on economies of scale. However, the increased trend towards multi interdisciplinary research, the fragmentation of communities is kind of creating a new opportunity. And I want to argue that these new collaboration spaces are a home, need a home, and learned societies working in collaboration with universities and research institutions can make those connections. So, as I said, it's our 150th anniversary this year. We've committed to developing the IET as an open research society this year. And we've transitioned all of our journals to gold open access. We've introduced new tools and services for our research communities. And today in this short presentation, I wanted to do two things. First, give you a quick overview of how we are tracking changes in the research workflow. And second, to give you a few examples about how we're responding to the changing needs. So in this morning's introductory comments, Dean Grant uh, talked about the rapidly changing environment and change has been a theme of the day. Uh, our challenge as the IET is how to understand the changing research workflow and how to systematically engage with our users and community members. How do we be part of the change process rather than just react to the change process? Um, I think we're all familiar that the drivers of change are well documented. There are political mandates around funding, uh, influencing where material, where scholarly output is published. There's technological changes. Technology is both fragmenting and connecting information at the same time. And then there is this sort of underlying change, demographic change around uh, particularly early career, mid-career researchers who see this convergence of social behaviors and work behaviors and expect their working tools and their working lives to be always on and always connected. So at the IET, we're trying to improve our impact by tracking these changes. And I want to share some of the research that we've done with you now. So the research started in 2018 and we, we began the process of systematically tracking changes in research behavior. This is work that we've continued and I'll share some of that with you shortly. Uh, this was an interesting 
piece of research where we asked researchers, what are you doing now and what do you anticipate you'll be doing more of uh, in the coming years? And as you'll see in this uh, first little bar I brought up, they expected researchers to do a little more of the, the research, the, the, what you might call classical research publication behavior. So authoring in a traditional journal article or presenting at a conference. Um, researchers anticipated doing quite a lot more of the open access or open publication behavior. So a rise there you can see from 37% who had published in an open access journal, anticipating that to go to 52%. So that's a significant change. And very significantly, what I'd call is the more um, open research workflow in terms of preprint archives, um, re reusing code, data access, data sharing, data repositories. We see, although we're starting from a very low base, a very uh, anticipated gr uh, high growth of those behaviors. We've, um, we've continued with uh, this research and we said, so where the funder is driving some top-down change into your behavior, um, where do you think more, more assistance is required? And I've indicated here, each of these is worthy of discussion, but indicated here some interesting elements around um, open access publication, data sharing, or uh, help in depositing in open research archives amongst um, a number of things. Uh, fun, so we've been asking, as I said, systematically our, our, our communities, given all of this change is taking place, what's our role? What's the role of the IET? What's the role of a, a research institution? And we were, we were um, actually quite surprised, I think, at this response to see, just to see that uh, we asked researchers who is best placed or who could help you to meet the challenges that you've identified in this changing world. And um, as you see here from this, this slide, um, I've identified that scholarly societies actually came out in the, in the rankings particularly um, uh, uh, thought of particularly highly as people who could help and, and support uh, government um, funding, governments and funding agencies were the foremost, um, but even down to employees, we see that em 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 employers, uh, tenure and promotion uh, committees, um, private funders are sharing technologies. We see in this constellation that uh, scholarly societies are rated highly as being able to help and serve. Um, as you can see, the reason why we're given is that we are independent not-for-profit, community-based, ethics seem to be ethically sound, trusted, and safe. Um, I also want to uh, share with you a, a little um, more research that has been ongoing. This is more recent research. Um, um, we have um, been asking a, a systematic set of questions We've closed this research a couple of weeks ago, and this is one of the first meetings we've had where we've shared this with, uh, with our communities. We can segment this research by job function, by um, uh, qualification, or by subject, if anyone's interested uh, subsequently. Um, so we, uh, sorry, I'm, I've run ahead of myself. We, uh, we have um, been asking what are the top three pain points in the research process? With the, the lens of open research, now as we've seen, has been one of the um, uh, one of the key drivers. And I think what's interesting to to start to digest is our respondents uh, uh, make a distinction between um, productivity prob uh, uh, objectives, resources, um, largely ranging around funding and collaboration. Um, discovery and innovation and impact. And here I've highlighted three of the key issues where we think we can start to provide um, better services. In terms of uh, pain points, our researchers um, 
saw that uh, securing the biggest pain point around the, uh, the workflow is around gaining um, uh, uh, funding. But then I've picked out three around the open uh, research um, story that you might find interesting around collaborating with colleagues, promoting research output, and preparing and storing data. I'm going to um, skip this slide because I think I might be running out of time. And I'm going to move on to, so having, having seen this, this uh, assimilated this information, having engaged over a number of years with uh, communities, we then were, were, um, were, uh, took on the challenge of what are we going to do about this. So on the 1st of January, we've taken the significant move of um, flipping our entire program of journals to open access to create a single portfolio of 42 gold open access journals. And we think we're the first learned society to make such a, a bold move. And um, this is why we've, we've done this. We want to improve access to and impact for our author's work. And since January, we've, this has been proven and we've had over 1.3 million downloads to our newly opened journal portfolio. Uh, we believe it's important that we align our publishing strategies with research funding policies globally. We are a policy driven um, um, organization. We engage with governments around the world on their um, policies. And we think now is the right time to put ourselves on the right side of a transformation towards open access. And beyond open access, we're embracing the idea of open research. And we're committed to work with members, research communities, libraries, institutions to improve research impact and research outcomes. Um, so our, our um, work to, hasn't just ended with opening our journal portfolio, but we're committed to engaging in the research, uh, um, the changing research, research workflow with new tools and services. So recently, I'll move on to another example, we launched InSpec Analytics. InSpec, many of you know, is a trusted abstracting and index and service. Um, around InSpec, we have built a new Inspe uh, analytics um, and insights tool uh, to add greater precision to, the res to research work. And we are starting to support researchers and research funders to meet the challenges of the new workflow. So um, we've harnessed the data asset that we have in InSpec, um, over 20 million curated records. We've connected those um, in response to the input we've had from our, our, um, our users. And I want to share with you um, a few insights into how that will merge as a workflow tool in the- open. Sorry to interrupt, Vincent. Uh, you have about three more minutes remaining. I think I might be getting, I might be getting to the point, Anthony, it's okay. All right. uh, we've, we've segmented the workflow through three prisms. One is uh, research directors who are interested in setting strategy, understanding institutional impact, competitive landscape, recruitment and collaboration. The librarian, many folks in this audience, evaluate how to evaluate collections better, assisting research discovery in your communities and advising on publication routes. And then finally, the researcher, and as I've just shown you the insights from the research about implementing, um, how to implement research more strategically, how to collaborate better, and how to understand publication impact maximization. So, a little example, um, Here's a, an example of a researcher in wideband gap semiconductors. And the questions they may be asking are, what opportunities are there for multidisciplinary collaboration? As you might have picked up in that really brief skate through the, the research, multidisciplinary um, engagement is a key issue in collaboration. Where should I publish? Uh, which journal should I read and publish in? How to optimize research to maximize impact? And how can I identify potential collaborators? So I've taken uh, this researcher using InSpec, uh, the, in, uh, the InSpec analytics tool. So I can now look at co-occurring control terms for the term wide back, wideband gap semiconductors. We have around 10 and a half thousand terms, and each of those terms has a concept page. And in this little um, example, I can show you the co-occurring terms with wide band gap semiconductors. And in that, I can see that, for example, the term nanofabrication 
has a greater citation profile when used in combination with wideband gap semiconductors. That may help me to focus my research and my publication strategy. I can also uh, identify, having identified terms that are of uh, interest to me, I can look at the output of an individual institution and its impact when I'm looking for collaborators. So here I've taken um, the, the term wide band gap semiconductors uh, for North Carolina State. We can see down here on the little right hand corner that Carolina State is the 23rd out of 570, 5740 ranking in the world. Um, it's collaborating with 147 institutions worldwide and has over this period had four over the period of five years had 452 authors. So again, I can begin to look at my areas of, of expertise, identify outputs, relative in, impact, and uh, look for collaborators. And um, finally, I can look at who Carolina State is, uh, is collaborating with. Here we can see the collaboration pattern over the five year period, and we can see for this particular um, term wide band gap semiconductors, Carolina State leading collaboration is with Cree Inc, which is in Durham, around the corner from you there. And beyond that, I can then drill down and find out who at Cree is the author or the author base who I'm collaborating with. And um, that's a really quick whistle stop tour. Um, we believe, I hope I've given you an insight into the importance of of um, uh, learner societies to change in line with a changing environment. I hope I've shown you that we believe that open research will, uh, will connect uh, and collaborate. Open research will engineer change. And um, thank you for listening. Hopefully I didn't go over too much, Anthony. You're fine, thank you. And okay, we are now at the Q&A portion of this session. If you have questions, you can enter it into the chat. Okay, any questions from anyone? I'll give you a few moments more to type and enter. I might have a question for my colleagues who gave the previous talk. Sure. Um, I, I thought it was fascinating and it's really interesting to, to, to for me to imagine what kind of topics were they, were they, was there any kind of pattern to the kind of topics and the subjects that people were selecting? There, there was, um, and there, there was, there were definite trends, um, especially like they came in waves, like everyone would try to um, pick an article of like their favorite celebrity. Um, we would get like LeBron James, um, and other famous athletes, and we'd have to redirect them because LeBron James's page needs no help from us. There are tons of people um, editing his page and keeping it up to date. Um, there were other, other people tended to pick hot topic issues as well, um, which would create a problem in the controversy section because it's harder as a new editor to contribute to articles that are being watched closely on Wikipedia. And then eventually, honestly, the things that students would eventually settle on were like hilariously random. They would, it would just be the most oddball thing that, you know, um, I think one student did the Nigerian dwarf horse or something one year, and it turned out that his family raised them on their farm in um, northern Mississippi. And so he edited that article. Um, they I think they get... I... Go ahead, Karen. I was going to say a couple of my favorites from 2020. Um, one student did uh, edited a page on um, Swedish colonialism mm -hmm. 
which was fascinating. I learned something about Vikings and, and he had some great graphics. And then another really interesting one was um, uh, a student was fascinated with Peaky Blinders, the, the television show. So he edited that page and found some um, really interesting um, information to add about the original Peaky Blinders um, gang. So yeah, the, Kotlin's exactly right. The ones they sort of landed on were very random. Okay, we have a question for Kotlin and Karen. Um, do you ever consider using government resources for your course? Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, we have not done that in the past and probably I would attribute that to um, somewhat of a weakness on, on mine and Karen's part in navigating government resources. We have a really robust government publications department because we are a um, depository for uh, government publications. And, um, but that would be another great way to extend this class to other parts of the library. Like we wanted to engage with um, special collections more closely in the future, working with government publications would also be a great direction to move in. Yeah, that's a really good idea for um, another place we can go for sources of, you know, Memphis, um, information that might not be, you know, out there on Google. Awesome. Any more questions for our panelists? Okay, if not, then we have now reached the end of our session and the conference. Um, as a reminder, um, I just wanna let everyone know that all sessions have been recorded and the recordings and slides will be made available in the coming week. If you have questions, um, please reach out to the speakers via email and thank you everyone for attending our conference. And thank you to the presenters for um, your session today. Thank you. Thank right, you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, Julie. Bye. -bye,